Thank you, Kyle, for inviting me again to come here. It's a pleasure. My wife and I love this conference. Um, we love you. And uh, we would far rather come to a conference like this than go to some conference where there's a big list of who's who uh, in Christian circles. We, we just truly do profit far more from something like this than something like that. And I've been to many things like that. Um, we also really enjoy singing with you. Uh, you have a... Uh, a unique, robust singing congregation, and it's not a foregone conclusion, I assure you. Uh, there are many congregations that are, are small, smaller and cannot uh, put the voices together, and there are congregations where many people are not musical, and uh, so when you get a congregation of seemingly uh, a large percentage of musical people that sing really well and know your songs well and sing such wonderful songs, it's really a pleasure to be part of um, um, we'll be looking at Hebrews, excuse me, Habakkuk, <laughs> uh, one letter difference there uh, in the abbreviation anyway, Habakkuk 3, and uh, briefly looking at verse 16, which I'll read first and then um, focus on, and then we'll come to 17 through 19, where that will be the focus today. Um, if you were not here on Thursday morning, um, my first message was in Habakkuk 1, and I gave a survey of the book and some of the well-known verses that come out of that book. Sometimes we know a particular verse, we've heard it a lot, but don't know which book it came from, and so many of those come from Habakkuk. One that I missed, this was brought to my attention, was in Habakkuk 3, uh, where there's that, that famous uh, verse, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. So we often uh, quote that, in wrath, remember mercy. And as we're asking God for revival and for him to pour out his spirit, we're praying for things like that. Um, so today, we'll, we'll pick up at verse 16. As you recall, this book is written uh, prior to the Babylonian siege and guaranteed destruction of the nation. Um, it's it's over. There's no doubt at this point that it's going to happen. There's no if at this point. Uh, God has decreed it and declared it. And Habakkuk is not even given the usual well if you know the Jeremiah 18 sort of thing of well if you hear this threatening and the people turn from their ways then I will relent concerning the calamity that I promised to bring on them. We don't even have those kinds of. Um, sayings in this book it's it's just going to happen and Habakkuk knows it and he's dreading it because of what it means he is complaining in chapter one about all the injustice around him and all the sin and the vileness of his own people and God's solution to that is to bring in the Babylonians to crush them and that's not really what he was hoping for and so he struggles with that and with the question of, well, how can that be the right thing to do in light of the fact that they're more wicked than we are? And so then God answers that problem, and I'm, I'm going to crush them too in due time. They will get what's coming to them. Then chapter 3 brings us into a psalm that's written for the choir master or choir director, the, the leader of the singing for the Levitical choir and to be sung in worship. And uh, you uh, brings us to verse 16, which I briefly touched on on Thursday. But he says there, after the psalm and the praising God for his uh, wonderful attributes, he comes down off the mountaintop of that, so to speak, to the present sobering reality of what's coming in this evil world that he lives in and this wicked country he lives in. And the judgment that is promised to come. And he says, when I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Uh, he had a healthy respect for the wrath of God when the wrath of God, just though that phrase is mentioned, that was not a laughing matter to Habakkuk. That was not something that you could just brush off and, oh, that's no big deal. Um, we can handle that. Uh, no, you can't. And, and he knew that they couldn't. And he, um, it made him tremble. It made him quiver. Um, he had such a 
respect for what that would mean. And you remember when David was given an option of what kind of beating he was going to get? Uh, and he basically, it was like, well, you can have seven years of famine, or you can have three days of plague, or you can have three months, I believe it was, of fleeing before your enemies. Maybe it was a little longer than that. And he didn't pick one, but he, he removed one. He says, whatever uh, you give me, don't let me fall into the hands of men. Um, that's the one I really don't want. Uh, the Lord's mercies are great, but when it comes through men, uh, the wrath of God, that's the one I don't want. But that's the one they're going to get here. And so that's why he's, he's trembling. They understand the depravity of man and what it means when thousands of young men move into your country to conquer you. That's not a good day for your country. Um, it's widespread upheaval. Think of Ukraine. Uh, dislocation of people, thousands of refugees uh, walking miles upon miles of miles. Um, it's not like you just stop at McDonald's along the way in your refugee trek and it's time for lunch. Um, uh -uh. That there, There's no McDonald's. Um, it's destruction of commerce and transport of goods. There's poverty. There's famine. The people that were working the farms aren't there to work them anymore. Um, they're, they're conscripted into war. Uh, we don't understand this. As I, as I indicated, we, we have not had foreign troops on our soil really since maybe, you know, the War of 1812 or the um, Revolutionary War. We were attacked on September 11th, and that was bad, but it wasn't followed by hordes of foreign armies coming on our soil and marching through our land, thankfully. Uh, but when that happens to you, you're in deep trouble unless God is with you and on your side, but God was the one bringing them to do this. The thousands of men who come from another country to, uh, to spend time in yours, uh, they're, they're hungry, and what do you suppose they're going to eat? They're going to eat your stuff. They're going to go on your farms and pick all your stuff from your gardens. On a modern day, they would come into your house and empty your refrigerator and freezer and cupboards. Uh, they're going to go butcher your cattle herd or your sheep herd. Uh, they're going to pick everything clean. They're going to burn a lot of things to the ground. Um, you won't be there if you know what's good for you. I mean, you will retreat uh, to where the armies are. If you are conscripted into the army, you'll be with the soldiers at a particular position. Um, if you're, you're caught outside of that and you're a man or a, a teenage boy or whatever, you'll, you'll be forced into slavery, um, if not killed. And then you'll be the one hauling buckets of water for them from the river to give drink to their soldiers. You'll be chopping wood. You'll be doing all the back-breaking work. And you'll be a forced labor when they, uh, the people flee to the cities. They get behind the strongholds and the walls and hopefully hold out. Um, but then you will be the one helping the Babylonians build the siege mounds to overcome that. And your own countrymen will be on that wall shooting arrows at you as you build the siege mound for the Babylonians. So you're likely to be the first one to fall from that sort of a thing. If you're a, a girl or a young woman, you better be long gone, uh, far away somewhere else. It's really going to be bad for you. Uh, Second Chronicles 36, 17 tells what happened in a nutshell. Therefore he, that is God, brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or infirm. He gave them all into his hand. So an old person, an infirm person, a sick person that can't do much and be of any use is either going to be just run through with the sword or uh, beaten to death with a club or just left to die uh, as someone who needs people to help them and there's no one to help them. So they'll just be left to starve to death, perhaps. Uh, when you had the warning that the armies were coming, you would close up shop you know, quickly and everything is turned upside down. When the Babylonians came, they set up camp for two and a half years around the city of Jerusalem after destroying all the other cities and strongholds that had held out for however long, then it's Jerusalem's turn. 
And they're there for two and a half years. Just imagine that, two and a half years. And you're one of the people that have escaped to the city, but you've got far more, far more people in the city at this point than the city is designed to hold. You know, it's you, you can only bring so many guests and visitors into a place and there's only so many hotels and so many extra beds and so forth. So it's overcrowded and there's nowhere to go. And there's that feeling of claustrophobia. Uh, the sleeping arrangements are not comfortable. The situation is fearful and tense. You are, people don't behave well under the best of circumstances, but under the worst of circumstances, it brings out the worst in people, particularly when the vast majority of them are wicked people who are, they are wicked. That's why these troops are being sent and brought upon them because of their exceeding wickedness. So you're not dwelling in the confines of Jerusalem with a bunch of brothers and sisters in Christ that can, you know, that are sanctified and the, the Lord is working in them and through them to mortify the flesh. That's largely not the case. Your soldiers are being picked off the wall and there's frequent ca casualties. You can hear them building the siege mounds and their instruments of war and doing whatever they do and shooting arrows over the wall and, and so forth. The food supply is dwindling. You've only got so much, so it's rationed. And you don't know how long you're going to be there. You're just hoping you can outlast them. But the Babylonians would outlast you. Um, they, just, they just wait until your food supply ran out. The babies are always crying. Disease spreads in such circumstances rapidly. So people are dying from disease. Uh, by the time a fight occurs, if it even gets to that point, your soldiers are so weak from hunger that they've got nothing to give. And so this was the glory of war. You know, uh, Habakkuk was, could see well through this glory of war. Uh, it's, it's awful. And he was dreading it. And he was just silently waiting for the day that was predestined to occur. And in the midst of that, he pens this wonderful poetic section here that we're all familiar with, I, I trust. Verse 17, although the fig tree shall not blossom, Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds' feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places. And then there's his closing note to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. And I wonder about this song that was written. Did they start singing this in worship? And did they have any idea what they were singing of this psalm in Habakkuk 3? You know, we do that sometimes. We sing songs. We know them by heart. We know the tune. We just enter in and we start singing and do we really know what we're talking about? Do we really enter into it? I think it's what Paul was referring to when he said, you're making melody in your heart, uh, singing in the heart. And yet this was for corporate worship and public worship, and you're dealing with uh, a group of unbelievers, likely, that don't even believe this prophecy. You know, that's the nature of being unbelieving. I don't believe you. Life will be, it will be good. You know, we got the temple and all the things they would boast in and brag about. We're God's people. That's not going to happen to us, Habakkuk. Jeremiah, you just read the book of Jeremiah, you see how they responded to his prophecies of the same ilk. The real question that I think we must pose to ourselves in a passage like this is, is God enough for me? That's the, really the question. I think that's what this boils down to. This passage in 17, 9 through 19 is really at the heart of the Christian faith. It's do you trust God? Do you love God more than anything else? Is he your all? Or is he just an accessory and our means to an end? Do you love God only to the degree that he provides you goodies? If the fig tree doesn't blossom anymore, will you still love God? If there's no 
fruit on the vines, if the labor of the olive fails, if there's no cattle or herds in the stalls, no more steak on the grill, will you still love God? We laugh at Joel Osteen. Uh, we mock his teaching, and in a sense that's appropriate. It's awful. He's a false prophet. But your best life now, because yeah, you've got to be kidding me. That, I mean, that, what a sales pitch for Christianity, your best life now. But there is this self-examination question of, am I, in the end, after all, kind of like Joel Osteen, where the reason I love God, the reason I'm fine with Christianity, the reason I'm fine with my Bible, and I'm on good terms with the Lord is because life is pretty good, because my fig tree is blossoming, and because there is a herd in the stalls, and because there is olive harvest. Does God merely exist to help us live a, a comfortable life? Is God our goal, the, the end, the telos? If you're you know, a, a, an avid reader, you might have come across a French term, raison d'etre. Maybe didn't know how to pronounce it, but it means the reason for existence, or the, for ju the justification for all things. Is God your raison d'etre, your reason for being? The reason you live the way you live, the reason you believe what you believe, the reason for the priorities that you have, for what you will accept and not accept, what you love and what you don't love. Can you join with Habakkuk and say a hearty amen to this section here? And can you join that chorus of voices of the saints throughout Scripture who said things very much like this, like David who said in Psalm 27, 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That's the one thing he asked for. And I believe that was written during his wandering days on the run from Saul. That's the one thing he wanted back. When there are many things he could have wished for, but that's the one thing. Psalm 63, one through three, he said, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. It's better than life. Asaph in Psalm 73, 25 to 26 said, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The sons of Korah in Psalm 8410 said, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. In Hebrews 11, we read of Moses, says, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the riches of Egypt. Job, it's not said exactly in the words, but the spirit of it is there, this kind of spirit that God is enough. When you get to the end of the book and he's, He's got no more complaining to do. God's answered him finally, and the answer has completely sobered him and shut him up. But he says this, uh, he answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. 
Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Think of Paul and what he said with a thorn in the flesh that he asked three times that it would be removed. And the answer was, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I just wish we could pick the weaknesses. In Philippians 3, 7 through 10, Paul said, But what things were gained to me? I counted those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That is, he's saying the same thing that Habakkuk is saying in Habakkuk 3. I will rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is enough. And I think it's in a sense underneath what Jesus was saying in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. It's rejoicing in God, in the will of God for him. So if at the table at lunch, there was two groups of people, let's just, just split it into two. And there was one long table here and one long table there. And on this table over here, there's a bunch of people in there. They're professing Christians, perhaps they're churchgoers, they're religious people. And they're talking about their 401ks and they're talking about the football game, or the basketball game. And they're, they're talking about things like that. And over here is a group of people that are part of this great cloud of witnesses that talk like that, where the Lord is their all. Which group do you find yourself drawn to more? Whom would you want to sit with? It's that question of where is your treasure? Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also cannot serve God in mammon. You cannot serve God in anything else as your reason for existence. We're warned that if we're serving created things, we're like the bad soils in the parable of the sower, the rocky soil or the thorny soil. The rocky soil represents those who wither away because of persecution. They fall away because God is not their all. God was a means to an end. They didn't sign up for this. This was not what they thought it meant to be a Christian. In persecution, people near to you will hate you. They'll turn on you. And if God is not your all, you won't be able to handle that. And the falling away will prove that you really didn't love God. You loved other things and God was just a means to an end. The loss of the fig tree, the loss of the grapevine or cattle, the loss of your job, your money, your possessions, those become too great of a loss. I didn't sign up for this. It's not what I had in mind with Christianity. Those things matter more than God does. Or it could be just the thorny ground soil, the love of money and possessions, the pleasures the worries of this world that choke the word out. These are not persecutors that are threatening to deprive you of your pleasures and take away your grapevine and your fig tree and your fields and your, your flock. In fact, there's an abundance of these things. It's like America. They're all around you. And your heart is on those things, not God. The rich young ruler is like that. 
he couldn't follow Christ. It's not because of persecution. There was that, but that wasn't the issue for him. It's that he could not leave the other things for Christ. He did not love Christ. Those things are more important to him than Christ was. So he couldn't join with Habakkuk in any kind of an honest way and say, yes, though the fig tree should not blossom, there be no fruit on the vines, though the labor of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the, be no, the herd be not in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. He couldn't say that. Oh, is God enough for you? Is he your all? Can you sincerely and honestly amen these words? Think of your plans for the future, what you have planned for yourself ahead. Maybe various things, a vacation that you plan to take, a big trip, a planned experience, a job that you're looking to, a promotion, a raise. Maybe it's recognition that you want. Maybe it's a relationship that you're hoping for or a relationship you're hoping will be restored. If you're unmarried, you're maybe hoping for a spouse. And you say to yourself, if I can just get married, if I can just find a spouse, then I'll be happy and then my problems will be solved. Or perhaps you are married and then you're having buyer's remorse. I think if I could just have a different husband than the one I've got, somebody more romantic, more considerate, somebody more talkative or something, but that's not what you got. Do you say to yourself, if I just had a different husband, then I would be happy? Perhaps you don't have children. And you're like Rachel who said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Is it a certain number of children? You can't be happy unless you reach a certain number. Is it appreciation or approval or recognition? Is it good health? You're in pain a lot, maybe all the time. It's chronic. And you think, if I could just be healed of this pain, then I would be happy again. Maybe it's productivity. You're just not productive anymore because of some physical issues or pain. And your righteousness is practically bound up in being productive. And now you're sitting there and there's not much you can do and people are having to wait on you and some of them are sighing. And you think, if I could just be productive again, then I would be happy again. You need to be a contributor and a benefactor, but now you're dependent on other people. All of these things that I mentioned can be taken away from you, and eventually all of them will. And then what? And then is God your all? And of course, it has to be settled before then. Times of deprivation and hardship, when the Babylonians would come and tear everything apart and raise everything to the ground and haul them off and they had no more freedom, no more city, no more home, no more spouse perhaps, no more children, no more parents, no more of anything that they had enjoyed. Then, the, then they will know, well, was God my all? Am I rejoicing in God now that everything's stripped from me? But of course, we have to ask these hard questions of ourselves before then. It's sometimes with then, it's a little too late. And we're not talking here about a pie-in-the-sky religion, a stoic kind of religion where such things happen and they just don't phase you. You know, you're just a flatliner that, no, that doesn't phase me. Yeah, I see that they just destroyed the city and the temple. Doesn't phase me. I, we're not, we don't mean that. Just mean is, is God your refuge in those hardships? He's your strength. Is he the one that helps you go on and continue and not commit suicide? In verse 18, Habakkuk, after contemplating the loss of his country and the loss of freedom, the loss of lives, the loss of his countrymen and perhaps relatives, all things I think symbolically uh, is signified there in those poetic phrases, the fig tree should not blossom and the yield of the olive, the labor of it should fail. It says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He's saying this before all this comes to pass. 
This is his resolution. He's not lying. He believes this will be the case. God gave him a foreboding sense of the future and what was coming. But that didn't make him give up in despair. He was resolved to exult in the Lord and in being saved. And when you realize that everything can be taken away from you and be obliterated, then that was his refuge. But I'll be saved, my soul. I will know the Lord still. I will love the Lord still. He'll love me still. It'll be okay because I belong to him. I'm still his. He still has my soul and the protection of it. That's how Paul could rejoice when he was in prison. Even though there's various bad actors out there going around preaching the gospel from bad motives and some of them seemingly just to stick it to him while he's in prison. And in Philippians 1, 15 through 18, he said, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And therein do I rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. Though he's in prison, he could be completely in the slough of despond, um, doubting castle, in despair, in depression, because he's in prison and there's all this work out there that needs to be done and he's needed and in so many places and he could be in despair, but instead he rejoiced in God. The Hebrew Christians, there's an amazing thing said of them in Hebrews 10.34, it says, for you had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. So somebody came in and took all their stuff and went through their stuff and took this and that and maybe at the point of a sword. And they had to sit there and watch them just make off with their all their stuff. Perhaps they're heirlooms, their keepsakes, their little treasures, whatever they might have, their food, their furniture, what money they had. And they, those thugs, and they're not nice people, and they mock you and they gloat and they boast as they do so. And they're walking off with your stuff and they accepted this joyfully. How can you accept it at all, much less joyfully? Because they had a better possession and a lasting one, God. He was the portion of their inheritance. Is he the portion of your inheritance? So you didn't get to go on that trip. That's disappointing, but you still have God. And he is the portion of your inheritance. So you lost your job. That's disappointing. But you can say, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. You've lost your health and it's in shambles. But since you have God, you can say your loving kindness is better than life. You've lost a child or a spouse to death. And it's devastating. There's no pie in the sky here. But there's still this sense in which you can say, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth. Yeah, they fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. See, if we don't, have this, if this is not real, we're in trouble because it's going to happen to all of us. If it hasn't already in some respect to each one of you, it's going to. It's going to come. It's not a matter of if pain is coming your way, it's when. It's not a matter of if you're going to have loss, it's when will you have loss and how much.
I grew up in a small town in Kansas. We were a 4A school. It means you had about 400 students. And we played this other town about an hour away or an hour and a half or something like that. Uh, Abilene. We have an Abilene, Texas. We have an Abilene, Kansas. So. And we hated them. <laughs> they were our worst, most despised rival. And we would have these basketball games, and you know how fans are. They get into their games and scream and yell at each other and scream at opponent players and scream at the officials and come up with all kinds of insulting chants and all of those sorts of things. And we had this sort of back and forth with, with Abilene, you know, and so if somebody shoots an air ball, you know what happens. The entire crowd of the opposing team shouts, air ball, air ball, air ball, and they just keep going. But if that team who shot the air ball was ahead, they would reply, scoreboard. <laughs> and it, it would just silence the air ball chant immediately. <laughs> and it was really bad if you shot an air ball and you were also behind. <laughs> But the point here is that, you know, we can shout scoreboard in response to all our deprivations, our setbacks, if the Lord is our portion and our strength, if we can rejoice in the Lord and exult in him. In verse 19, Habakkuk said, the Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places. But what is your strength? Is it your wisdom, your wealth, your intelligence, your religious performances? Is it your country, your military? It's got to be the Lord God. He's the reason that you succeed at anything, is the reason you're still alive. If he intends for you to be alive tomorrow, he'll get the job done. If he wants to bring you home tomorrow, why would you want to stay here against his will? He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And if you know and love him, he will never leave you. If you're hauled off to some foreign land, he can handle taking care of you there. If you go to prison, he can handle your care in prison. Paul had a special time of rejoicing in prison. If you're appointed to die, he can shepherd you across the river to the other side. The Lord God is your strength. When he says, he makes my feet like hind's feet, a hind, of course, is a deer. And the deer, when we think of the the feet of a deer, the hind's feet, they're swift and in mountainous regions they can escape from their enemies and bolt up the mountain and then stand out triumphantly looking down upon their former pursuers. And that's the image that we have here that God makes us to walk like that on like hind's feet. And high places is not a reference here to the place of idolatry like it often was in Israel or the place of unapproved, unauthorized worship uh, like it so often was in the book of Kings. You know, they, they continued offering sacrifices on the high places where you weren't supposed to do that. I don't think that's the meaning here. I think it has the meaning of when we are on the mountaintop, so to speak, where we're in moments of sanity and clarity and this place of the soul where God is our inheritance and our strength and we are able to rejoice in God. That's the high places that I think he's referring to. The danger is not being hauled off to Babylon. The danger is a cold heart and foolishness and vanity and idolatry. There are things worse than being conquered by a foreign army. There's things that are worse than having America go down the toilet and become a nothing country. We're fixing our eyes on things above, not things here below, rejoicing in God. In that parable of the pearl of great price, 
The kingdom is described as like unto a merchant sinking goodly pearls. As I never noticed it before, and maybe I'm putting too much significance into it, but the plural there, he's seeking pearls. It's like I'm seeking several things. Uh, lots of them. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And his search was over. He's not saying, oh, I got one good pearl. Now I'm going to go continue to find all the other pearls that I was looking for. Christ is the pearl of one of great price. When one finds him, you found it. You sell everything you have to obtain him. Every hindrance, every stumbling block, every competing thing is sold. That is what must happen for you and me. And living in America is, is perhaps harder than it is to live in Ukraine right now in this way. In one way, of course, it's physically speaking. And there are spiritual challenges with that as well and what they're dealing with in that kind of upheaval. Or to live in North Korea or China or Iran or Saudi Arabia. In one sense, it's more dangerous to live in this country than it is there. Because here, Satan's methods here, the temptations that are here and that are available, and the way that can just be worked and just sort of streamlined right into the Christian faith as though it's an integral part of it, are exceedingly dangerous. It's hard for missionaries to come back to America and visit because they see things in this culture that are disgusting and it's sickening. And they see that the church is infected with it. And so God help us and help us to make God our portion, our inheritance forever. Let's pray.